Today, we're going to learn about how viruses cause cancer and how this was discovered. And we're going to start with an experiment. We're going to take an embryo, could be a hamster or a mouse embryo, you see here in the upper left. We're going to chop it up and make single cells. We're going to chop it up with trips, and then we're going to put it in a culture dish. And the cells, are mostly fibroblasts, will stick to the plastic of the dish and form a nice monolayer, as shown here on the lower left, of what we call normal cells. These cells will grow. They will fill the dish. You can then trypsinize them and dilute them and replate them, and we call that a passage. You can do that for 20 to 30 times, uh, and eventually the cell growth rate will decrease, as shown on the graph at the right. After about 30 days or so, uh, a new kind of cell will appear in this culture, what we call an immortal cell, and that will live forever, as the word immortal says. Now, you can accelerate this process of getting these immortal cells or transformed cells by treating the cells with a mutagen. For example, if you put a chemical mutagen on these cells, you will then get foci of transformed cells emerging rapidly. And those are shown on the lower right. The transformed cells, you can see, look morphologically very different from the normal cell. So this is the property that we're going to talk about today, transformation and how it relates to cancer. Now, transformed cells have a number of different properties compared with normal cells. First of all, they are immortal. They grow forever. And HeLa cells are an example of that. HeLa cells are isolated from Henrietta Lacks' tumor in 1951, and they continue to divide today. They keep going and going and going. And normally, your cells don't divide forever. They divide for 20 to 30 generations, as we saw in culture, and then they die. But for some reason, transformed cells keep on dividing, and that's not good. When cells divide forever, they accumulate mutations. And if you look at the genome of HeLa cells compared to a normal human, it is riddled with mutations that accumulate every time the DNA divides. In addition to being immortal, transformed cells have lost dependence on anchorage. They don't, um, they don't have to sit in, on a plate, on a plastic surface any longer. They can grow in suspension. Uh, they don't stop growing when they touch one another. So a normal cell on the top uh, A, as soon as the cells reach each other, they stop growing. But transformed cells, they keep growing and they pile up. They can make colonies in agar if you, put an, if you mix them in an agar overlay. An individual cell will form a colony, whereas that's not a property of a normal cell. And these cells have decreased requirements for growth factors. They need less serum than regular cells. And when we see later on what's going on in these cells, you'll understand that. Now, that's transformation. Oncogenesis is something different. Oncogenesis is the development of cancer. And it, we often think of cancer as a tumor which is a swelling caused by abnormal growth of tissue. So in a tumor, the cells keep dividing uncontrollably. They're transformed, but they're more than transformed as well. And a tumor, of course, can be benign. It can be, remain restricted, or it can be malignant. It can, trans, it can move elsewhere in the organism. Cancer is a genetic disease. It's caused by alterations in the genome. And over 8 million people die every year in developed countries of cancer, leading cause of death. S cancers arise when you accumulate enough mutations in your genome. And if we think about a dozen in different sorts of genes uh, that are in pathways that govern cell regulation and proliferation, survival, cell fate, and maintenance of genome integrity. Now, the mutations that cause a cancer, you may inherit them from your parents or they may arise in your DNA as a consequence of damage. If you live in an area with mutagens, you will accumulate mutations, ultraviolet light, uh, and so forth. And viruses can cause those mutations as well. And today we're going to see how a couple of different kinds of viruses can lead to mutations that cause cancer. Now, a key point to remember, this is important, Transformation and oncogenesis are two different things. Transformation is taking a cell that would normally have a finite lifespan in culture and making it live forever. You make it transformed. You give it all those other properties that we just listed in addition to living forever. 
So again, on the left there are transformed cells. These may or may not cause tumors in an animal. To make a tumor, you need additional genetic changes. So the transformed cell divides forever, and as it divides, every cycle it accumulates mutations. And when it hits the magic 12 in the right genes, roughly, it will become a tumor and cause cancer. Now, studying virus transformed cells, we'll see today how viruses can make cells transformed. Take a normal cell and infect it, it will transform the cells. Uh, studying these cells has given us the insight to what makes a tumor. First, you transform the cell, and then you accumulate mutations to make a tumor. Now, viruses transform cells. They do not cause tumors. The tumor formation happens after the cell is transformed, and it keeps dividing and dividing and dividing and accumulating mutations. So when we say viruses cause cancer, they actually only do half of it. They cause transformation of cells, and then the rest is up to the cell to keep dividing and accumulating those mutations needed for for cancer. Now today, we're actually going to talk just about transformation. We're not going to talk about cancer at all, but it's an essential step leading to oncogenesis. And here are some human cancer viruses. We will not talk about any of these today because I want to tell you about the history of understanding of virus transformation, and it involves viruses not infecting people. But today, we know that viruses are contributing factor in about 20% of human cancers. And these are the viruses that cause human cancers, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, and the cancers here, Burkitt's lymphoma, uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, hepatitis B, and C virus, we talked about last time, causing liver cancer. Uh, two retroviruses, HTLV-1 and HIV-1, are, are responsible for a variety of human cancers. I didn't list anything for HIV-1 because there are many, as we'll see later in the lecture on HIV. Papillomaviruses cause a variety of uh, cervical, penile, anal, genital, head, and neck cancers. Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus and Merkel cell polyomavirus. Now these were not the first viruses to be discovered to be involved in cancers. Those we'll, we'll talk about today. Transformation and oncogenesis is not needed for the replication of any virus. So I used to put this slide up, and then last year I had to put an asterisk. You know, there's always an asterisk in biology and in record books as well. It turns out there is a fish retrovirus uh, for which making a tumor is needed for spread of the virus. And uh, that's the one that we know of, but all the viruses we're gonna talk about today, in order to replicate, they don't have to transform cells, they don't have to make a tumor in order to replicate. It's a byproduct, it's an accident. Keep that in mind. The story begins on October 1st, 1909. A farmer from New Jersey brought Dr. Peyton Rouse a chicken from his farm, and Rouse was working at the Rockefeller Medical Institute. The chicken had a tumor, a sarcoma on the side of the chicken. You can see it in this photograph. And he was interested in understanding what caused this tumor. He thought it might be a virus. Virus had been discovered, viruses had been discovered, remember, at the end of the 1800s. So he took this tumor, he ground it up, he filtered it through a filter to remove cells and bacteria, and he took the filtrate and he injected it into the chicken, and it caused a tumor. Cancer could be caused by a virus infection. He was very excited about this, but it took the world 50 years to actually believe Dr. Rouse. He got the Nobel Prize in 1966, which I think is the longest incubation period ever for a Nobel Prize. But his virus that caused the tumor of that chicken is called Rouse sarcoma virus. It's named after him. And it caused a sarcoma, which is a solid tumor. It was a key player in two more Nobel Prizes, as you will see today. Those so three Nobel Prizes from one uh, virus. Now. There's a wonderful book that documents this whole story, much more than I'm gonna tell you today. Uh, it's by Siddhartha Mukherjee, who is a clinician uh, up at Columbia Medical Center. And he wrote this book, The Emperor of All Maladies, which won a Pulitzer Prize. Anybody read this book? I highly recommend it, it's really good. He's a great writer and he understands uh, what he's writing. And so I'm gonna quote some things from him because he puts it really well. So Rouse is in 1909, his first experiment. By the 1950s, cancer researchers had split into three camps. 
They're the virologists who claim viruses cause cancer, but we'd never found any in humans yet. Epidemiologists argued that exogenous chemicals caused cancer, but they couldn't explain how. And a third camp possessed weak evidence that genes internal to the cell might cause cancer. So all these people were right. And it took virology to unify them. Okay, and we're gonna see how that worked today. By the way, they made a movie of this book. Ken Burns uh, made a movie of it. It was released a couple of months ago. I haven't watched it, but it's supposedly good. Now, this story begins in 1951. So people have been working on Rouse virus for all these years. They can't figure out how it causes tumors. Howard Temin, a virologist, goes to Caltech. He's going to study fruit flies. He gets tired of fruit flies and switches to study Rouse sarcoma virus in Renato Dobeco's lab. And uh, at this point in time, cell culture had just been developed. Up until the 50s, we could not grow cells in culture. So Dobeco says, study this virus in cells. Up until the 50s, the virus had only been shown to cause tumors in chickens. But Temin said, I want to do this in a Petri dish. So after seven years, he succeeded in infecting cells in culture uh, and making them transform. So he added the virus to a layer of normal cells, very much like the experiment we started with. Uh, the infection causes them to grow, forcing them to form tiny distorted heaps. This is Mukherjee's writing containing hundreds of cells that Temin called foci. The foci, he reasoned, represented cancer. Cells growing uncontrollably, unstoppably. Now, they're not, they're not quite cancer. They're transformed cells, which is a step before cancer. He didn't know this at the time, though, but we know that in hindsight. So these are some examples of avian cells transformed by Rouse sarcoma virus. Here is, for example, on the left, a focus of cells on a normal cell background. These are avian cells infected. You have a single focus of cells that have been transformed by the virus. Again, their growth properties have been changed in the ways we talked about earlier. Uh, and there's some other examples here of round refractile cells uh, as well. So the morphologies can be slightly different. Now, Tamin noticed that this RNA virus was making a permanent change to the cell. These transformed cells grew forever, and they had the same morphology. And that's what got him thinking that these RNA tumor viruses must have an enzyme that makes a DNA copy. And that led him to discover reverse transcriptase, which we talked about in a previous lecture. So this was the reasoning that he followed, because this is an RNA virus. He discovered RT, and he and David Baltimore got a Nobel Prize for that. That's the second Rouse-related Nobel Prize. All right, so that's RNA tumor viruses so far. There's also a parallel study going on where people are finding that certain DNA viruses can cause tumors as well. In 1962, uh, polyomavirus was found to transform baby hamster kidney cells. And in 1964, SV40 was shown to transform mouse cells. Now, in these experiments, the transformants were rare. They would infect the cultures and most of the cells would die and a few foci would arise as transformed cells, and they would go on to be immortal. So now we have RNA and DNA viruses transforming cells. So how can a virus infection transform a cell? There are three rules that we have to adhere to. First of all, the virus cannot kill the cell. Obviously, if it killed the cell, it can't live forever, because that's one of the definitions of transform, that the cell is immortal. So you have to reduce, eliminate cytopathic effects. You have to reduce virus replications. And typically, these transformed cells do not make virus particles. And finally, the cell has to continue to divide. It has to become immortal. OK, so three requirements for transforming a cell. Does this ring a bell? Does this sound familiar to you in any way? What, is this, what kind of an infection does this sound like? It sounds like a persistent infection, exactly. The first two parts, no cytopathic effects, suppression of virus particle production. That's what we talked about last time. Transformation is a kind of persistent infection. These things are, are all similar. Of course, they don't, even in, in people infected with viruses persistently, the cells continue to divide as well. So the last point holds uh, as well. All right, number question one, which of the following is not a property of transformed cells? Not a property. In increased requirements for growth factors, immortality, loss of anchorage dependence, loss of contact inhibition, or colony formation in semi-solid media. 
That's right. A is not a property. Decreased requirements for growth factor is a property of transformed cells. The others who answered, let's see, so only one other, loss of anchorage dependence, that is a property of transformed cells. Okay, so now let's put together this RNA tumor virus and DNA tumor virus story and see how we got to an understanding of, of how viruses cause tumors. So on the left, we have retrovirus studies beginning in the 1900s with Rouse. Um, we have DNA viruses. They were first discovered as causing tumors in the 1920s. And you're going to see uh, this also converged with studies in cancer bi biology. We won't talk about, but that happened as well to unify the field. In the 60s and 70s, these came together. And as a result, we have today's understanding, a unified theory of growth control of cells. And it's because of virus studies. If there weren't viruses in this story, I think we'd still be trying to figure out what controls the growth of cells. So we're going to start with retroviruses, the Rouse sarcoma virus. And we're going to talk about uh, the in vitro studies. We're going to pick up uh, where Howard Temin came in. And we're going to see what that leads to. The story here is that uh, every chicken flock in the world is infected with a retrovirus called avian leukosis viruses. Every chicken. Think about that next time you have chicken. It's another thing I'm going to eliminate from your habits, eating chickens. And then later I'm going to eliminate beef. Okay, and then, you, and then you can eat plants, but they have viruses in them too. Uh, they're in all chicken flocks in the world. It's a retrovirus, very much like retrovirus we've talked about. They were first identified in 1908, the year before Rouse, uh, by two scientists. But no one at the time thought that leukemia was actually a cancer. So no one paid attention. And then when Rouse did his thing, they said, ah, here's a cancer virus. Most chickens are infected within a few months of hatching. And this goes for Purdue chickens as well as every other chicken on the planet. They get the, inf they get the virus from the flock. Um, leukemia occurs in birds older than two, uh, sorry, 14 weeks of age, 3%, not a lot. But they get leukemia. And they get sick, and they're cold, so they are not sold. 97% of the birds have a transient viremia, and they get immune and don't develop leukemia. So all the birds get infected, but only a few percent get leukemia. As the birds get older and they're infected, and of course, we slaughter chickens early on for meat. We leave some of them for egg layers. And as the chickens age, if you leave them to live for a while, they will develop a variety of other cancers, uh, including connective tissue tumors or sarcomas. That's what a sarcoma is, a solid tumor of connective tissue. If you get virus from these tumors, and that's one of the things that Rouse did, and you would put them into a new chicken, they cause sarcomas. They don't cause leukemia. So they're already, you can tell they're already different from the avian leukosis virus that started out in these chickens. And this is what one of the viruses that Rouse isolated, Rouse sarcoma virus, or RSV. This is a virus that's isolated from an older chicken with a tumor, not the early chickens that all have avian leukosis virus infection. Now, as you'll see in a moment, most of these viruses, you can do this today. You can still find chickens with tumors and isolate viruses from them. Most of them are defective, which means they can't replicate on their own. And I'll show you what that means in a moment. It turns out that Rouse's virus was not defective. So he was really lucky. And that's the way science sometimes works. You are good at what you do, and you do nice experiments, but you're also lucky. And he happened to isolate for the first time a non-defective virus, which means he could grow it in culture. Otherwise, he never would have been able to grow the virus. So Rouse sarcoma virus, but not ALV, is causing tumors. Why not? Turns out later in the uh, 70s and 80s was found that the viral genomes are recombinants that you get out of tumors. So they are ALV but they've acquired a new piece of DNA. So the virus is, again, the Rouse sarcoma virus that causes tumors is basically ALV, the original virus that infected chickens, but it's picked up a host gene from the chicken cell. And that's what was shown by Michael Bishop and Howard Varmus. And they were the first to identify the first uh, such gene, and that was called the SARC gene because it was found in Rouse sarcoma virus. Uh, and this is a cellular gene that the virus has picked up, and that's what makes it cause tumors in chickens. And they got the Nobel Prize for that in 1989. Now, Varmus is working at Sloan Kettering now, so if you see him walking around, 
you should go up to him and thank him for the first oncogene. He'll, you see, he'll probably like that a lot. Okay, so here was their insight. Birds come down with a variety of tumors, not just sarcomas, they develop other tumors as well as they age. And these tumors all have retroviruses in them that are derived from avian leukosis virus. Most of them are defective, as I told you, and they're all different. These viruses have all picked up different genes, as you will see in a moment. As I told you, his uh, Rouse's isolate was not defective. Now, each tumor has a different retrovirus associated with it, and when people studied them beyond Rouse sarcoma virus, they got all these other viruses and studied them. Each one had a different cellular gene picked up and was enabling the virus to cause tumors. And this was a gold mine. For years, people studied these continuously and kept isolating and identifying new cellular genes, which, when picked up by a retrovirus, would transform the cells. That was what they're doing. Remember that. They're not causing cancer, actually. The virus is just transforming the cells. And then as the cells replicate, the rest happens. So here are some of these viruses. So uh, these are the genomes of what we call transducing retroviruses. It's because they're picking up a gene from the host cell, and that gene is, is causing them to transform cells. On the left are all the avian transducing retroviruses. These are all isolated from chickens with different kinds of tumors. We have sarcoma. So the original virus is avian leukosis virus that infects all chickens. And then we have Rouse sarcoma virus from a sarcoma. There's another sarcoma virus down here. You can see different tumors, sarcomas, myeloblastosis, um, myelocytomas, erythroblastosis, reticuloendotheliosis, all different kinds of tumors. And from each one, they got a different variant of avian leukosis virus, the difference being that they've all picked up different host genes. So here's Rouse sarcoma virus. It picked up a SARC gene in red. Uh, and the avian myoblastosis virus, for example, picked up a gene called MIB. They named the gene after the kind of tumor that the virus was originally isolated from. MIB, MIC, MIL, YES, ERB, and REL, et cetera, et cetera. And these names uh, should sound familiar because some of them now are part of normal cell pathways that we have studied extensively. All right, but the, the key here is that Rouse's virus was non-defective. So here at the top is the avian leukosis virus, GAG, Paul, envelope, and look at Rouse sarcoma virus, GAG, Paul, uh, envelope, and, they st and SARC has been stuck in in addition. Nothing has been deleted. But all these other viruses, you're putting in an oncogene, as these are called, and taking away, vi away virus sequences. So these are all defective. From Rouse down, they're all defective. You can see, for example, that MIB has MIB stuck right in envelope. So this virus can't make an envelope protein and it's defective. It cannot replicate, can't make particles. On the right are some mammalian transducing retroviruses. These have been isolated from tumors in a variety of mammalian species, including mice. Let's see what we have here. A cat. We have a couple of cat tumors. Uh, we have a, a, a monkey tumor as well. You notice none of them are from humans. We don't, have, we don't seem to have uh, retroviruses like these that cause tumors. So again, they all pick up different uh, sorts of oncogenes from a prototype uh, virus here. So that's why I say Rouse was lucky because his virus was not defective. So a defective virus would require a helper virus. If you happen to know that a gene is missing, part of envelope is missing, you can take that virus and co-infect with a wild-type virus. The wild-type virus will provide envelope and you can get particles made. And typically uh, these are things that are deleted during oncogene capture. So again, I'm showing you the myeloblastosis and Rouse sarcoma examples, just to show you again, Rouse is not defective. SARC is just added to the genome, whereas MIB is stuck into envelope, and that disrupts uh, the envelope gene. So you can see that Rouse was lucky. If he had picked up a defective one, he wouldn't have been able to grow it, and that would have been the end of his experiment. Now you may be wondering how these retrovirus capture a cellular gene. Because I told you a long time ago that once the retrovirus goes in the genome, can't get it out again, right? So you may be wondering, how does it come out with an oncogene? And that's a very good question. It's some odd, aberrant event. So here, for example, let's start with uh, viral DNA integrating into host DNA. So the retrovirus has already undergone reverse transcription. 
You have a double-stranded DNA copy of the genome. It's integrated into the host cell. It's now a provirus. And of course, from there, transcription makes viral RNA. What we think happens is, you know, our genomes undergo random mutations and deletions. At some point, there's a deletion at the right end of the provirus that removes the LTR at the right end. And the LTR at the right end has the stop sequence for transcription. So now what you get on the lower left here, deletion, you get a genome without the ability to stop transcription. So every time you make a viral RNA, the transcript extends into neighboring sequences in the genome. And if the retrovirus happens to have integrated next to an oncogene, then this viral RNA is going to have oncogene sequences in it. And you can see that's shown here in the virus particle. Uh, with the, the green is the original genome, and then the, the red is the oncogene sequence. Uh, and then eventually this will be incorporated into the virus particle, and you get proviruses uh, with the oncogene sequence in it, and those will cause uh, transformation of cells. So that's how you capture an oncogene. Now the study of avian and mammalian transforming retroviruses has yielded over 60 oncogenes. Now in the cell, they are called proto-oncogenes. And there are over 60 of them, and we've learned that they all control cell growth. They're highly regulated in the cell because we don't want our cells to be dividing all the time. That has bad consequences. <coughs> So the normal cellular genes, we abbreviate with a little C in front of them, like C-SARC, MCMAS, et cetera. And then the retroviruses, when they pick them up, we call them V-something, V-SARC, V-MIC, uh, et cetera. So these are oncogenes. They encode oncoproteins because they are proteins that can lead to transformation and oncogenesis. So these all are involved in the control of cell growth. So that should make sense because the virus is somehow uh, altering cell growth. It's making cells divide uncontrollably. And now you can see if you're introducing a protein involved in cell growth, that might be the consequence. So this was really a, 20 years or so, a golden era where people were studying these genes and really understanding how cell growth control, how cell growth was controlled. Now what are these proteins, these 60 or so different proteins? So here is a, a diagram of a cell and what we're showing on this cell is the pathway involved in the control of cell division. And all of these proteins identified in viruses that came from the cell, these oncoproteins. And they, it's really not a good name because in the cell, they're not there to cause tumors, right? But they were called that initially because that was the phenotype in the virus-infected cells. All of these oncoproteins are involved in regulating cell division. And the pathway starts at the cell surface there are cell receptors for growth factors. So when you add a growth factor to a cell, that makes the cell divide. When you eat something nutritious and it's digested, the, it contains growth factors that bind to receptors on your cells and make them divide. And so the receptors on the cell surface, there are different ones for different growth factors. Those are some of, there is encoded, they are encoded by some of the oncogenes picked up by retroviruses. In fact, one of the oncogenes called cis is actually a growth factor itself. There are also membrane-bound protein kinases that are in this pathway, so uh, growth factors bind receptors. There's a signaling cascade occurring through membrane-bound kinases, G proteins, cytoplasmic protein kinases, and eventually uh, some of these proteins get into the nucleus and stimulate transcription of genes involved in cell proliferation. At every step of this mitogenic pathway, the oncogenes can be found. So growth factors, growth factor receptors, membrane brown kinases, G proteins, cytoplasmic kinases, and nuclear transcriptional regulators. You can see all of these are given these funny names from the viruses that we just talked about, and they're all components of this pathway. So remember, the original phenotype observed in cultured cells starting with um, temin was transformation. We learned that these viruses are picking up cell genes and they're transforming cells because they're delivering components of this highly regulated pathway. So the virus is delivering a growth factor, makes the cells divide. It's delivering some of these other proteins uh, in here as well. And as long as the virus is providing this protein, the cells keep on dividing and that's why they become immortalized. So this is really a really remarkable finding.
So let's put it in the context of the cell cycle because as we go into the mechanism of what's going on here, you're going to need this. As you know, cells have a regular cycle in which there is a mitosis point, the M here at G0. Uh, and then they go through a phase called G1 where they get ready to make uh, DNA, DNA. They grow. They um, uh, produce DNA in the S phase, the synthesis phase, so that's DNA replication. Uh, then there's another pause uh, during which there are other biosynthetic activities, and then we have cell division, all right, about 24 hours for most cells. The signal that gets cells to go through this cycle is provided by growth factors, uh, the mitogenic signals, and we, knew, we identify them as proto-oncogenes, cells, uh, genes in a cell that are picked up by retroviruses. So with well, that pathway I just showed you, the input of that pathway is into the cell cycle here, and it drives the cell cycle around. So these are called proto-oncogenes. They're also called mitogenic factors, depending on whether you have a virus or a cell-centric view of things. And these were identified by studying these transforming retroviruses. We call these dominant oncogenes because you just need to put one copy of the gene in a cell and it will start the cell dividing all right and again as long as the retrovirus is there making this gene product some part of this mitogenic pathway you're going to be stimulating the cell to get through the cycle over and over so it's no longer regulated being part of the virus means that this gene is no longer regulated now we now know today that there are three classes of transforming retroviruses which transform cells by different mechanisms, three different mechanisms, and at different rates. We have the rapid tumor formation by viruses like Rouse sarcoma virus. Here you infect an animal within two weeks you have a tumor. Or you infect cells and they're transformed very quickly. And that's because the virus carries an oncogene and it's immediately produced upon infection and that makes the cells start dividing and never stop. Then we have transforming retroviruses with intermediate kin kinetics of tumor formation. Um, and this, an example of this is avian leukosis virus, the parent of Rouse sarcoma. There's no, there's no oncogene in ALV, but it still causes leukemia, which is a cancer. Okay? There's no dominant oncogene in these viruses, but they turn on the expression of oncogenes that are in the cell. We'll see how that works in a minute. So they, they will cis-activate uh, other genes, so if the provirus integrates next to an oncogene, it will turn on that oncogene and you get tumors. And finally, you have retroviruses with slow kinetics of tumor formation like HTLV. Human T-cell leukemia virus it takes years to get a tumor. There's no oncogene in these viruses. It does not cause cis activation. What happens here is a viral regulatory protein activates oncogenes in the chromosome by transactivation. All right, we're going to look at the mechanisms of this in detail in a moment. But again, three classes of RNA tumor viruses classified according to how quickly they transform cells and the mechanism uh, of transformation. So here are the three of them. Transducing retroviruses, they cause rapid transformation of cells. They carry an oncogene. This is a diagram of the viral, the provirus with the two LTRs and the virus genome in the middle. This virus gets into cells that immediately begins synthesizing the oncogene and the cells get transformed rapidly. The, the intermediate uh, speed transforming viruses, they're called cis-activating. They have no oncogene in them. They haven't picked up an oncogene, but what they do is they will activate transcription of a downstream oncogene if they integrate next to it. Remember, this is a provirus integrated into the host DNA. And the right promoter, uh, the right LTR, contains a promoter. Remember, both LTRs are identical. They both have promoters and terminators of transcription. And normally this one on the right would terminate viral transcription, but there happens to be another promoter here, and that can cause transcription of an mRNA encoding whatever is adjacent to the insertion. So if this virus integrates near an oncogene, it's going to turn it on and cause a tumor. It's going to cause transformation. And finally, we have the long-term, the slow transforming retroviruses. There's no oncogene. Uh, it doesn't integrate next to a, an oncogene, but what we think is that 
of one of the viral proteins called X is a transcriptional transactivator. We think it is normally needed for transcriptional transactivating of the LTR promoter, but we think it can also work on a cellular gene and cause upregulation of that as well. This cellular gene is not necessarily an oncogene, as in the first two cases. It can simply be a gene that encodes a mitogenic protein, a protein that causes cell proliferation. And interleukins fit the bill. These are proteins made during the immune response whose job it is to make cells proliferate. And we think this virus activates their synthesis, such as IL-2 and its receptor. Okay, three different transforming retroviruses, three speeds of transformation, and three distinct mechanisms uh, of transformation. We've talked about mammalian transforming retroviruses and avian transforming retroviruses. These, the, the transformation of cells is a mistake. The replication cycle of these viruses does not require transformation in order for it to succeed. All right, the picking up of an oncogene is a mistake. The integration next to an oncogene is a mistake. None of that is needed for virus replication. So this is a mistake that has, we have studied for many years and it's been very informative, but it is absolutely unnecessary. No obvious requirements for transformation or oncogenesis, which is a downstream event, if, uh, or I should say consequence of transformation. Now, there's one example, there's one exception. And you know, every year I used to say, transformation is not needed for any retrovirus. And of course I put my lectures on YouTube and one year someone heard that who happens to work on a retrovirus called the walleye dermal sarcoma virus. This is a retrovirus of walleye fish. This is a walleye and um, causes a sarcoma. You can see this fish has a sarcoma here. But this sarcoma is needed for the virus to, to spread between fish because these tumors form and then they drop off into the water and that's how the virus spreads to other fish. So it's actually needed for transmission of the virus. So to say that you know, all transformation is not needed for virus, retrovirus replication isn't correct. So I thank her for that correction. And there are probably more out there, you know, as I said, there are always asterisks and that's that one. Next question. Uh, which of the following allows Rouse sarcoma virus to transform cells? Presence of the envelope gene, presence of a Paul gene, presence of a SARC gene, presence of LTRs, none of the above. Presence of a SARC gene. So you can only have one answer, one correct answer in this question, right? Because none of the above would include all of them. SARC gene is absolutely needed to transform cells. That's the oncogene that's picked up by the virus. And um, you don't need any of these other things to do that. The LTRs are certainly not needed. It's not a matter of downstream activation of an oncogene. All right, so let's look at DNA tumor viruses now. And these were studied, discovered in the 1920s. 1959 converged with uh, RNA tumor virus biology and cell cancer biology in the 60s and 70s. And as I said, that has helped refine our theory of growth control. So the first DNA tumor viruses discovered were papillomaviruses that cause warts in rabbits. These were identified by a virologist, Richard Shope, in 1933. Any of you ever heard of a jackalope? Yes, a jackalope is a mythical creature that people have supposedly seen in the wild, a hybrid between a um, jackrabbit, jackrabbit and an antelope. But they don't exist. This is a jackalope right here. It's a rabbit with papillomas growing from its face and head. You can see on the left, lots of these papillomas. So these are extended warts, basically. They are hyperproliferating tissue. The cells are transformed and dividing uncontrollably, so they make weird structures. Here's another one here on the right. These fall off, and they don't hurt the animals at all. They're not, they're not uh, malignant. They're just extensive outgrowths, and there's, they're caused by a virus, a DNA tumor virus that spreads uh, among the rabbits. So jackalope not, doesn't exist. It's a DNA tumor virus. So those are the first DNA tumor viruses discovered of rabbits. In 1953, Ludwig Gross discovered some polyomaviruses uh, that cause transformation of mice. They cause tumors under rare conditions. Um, so the natural host of these viruses is the mouse. They're called murine polyomaviruses. And 
and every mouse in nature, they have these viruses. They don't cause cancer in mice. But if you infect hamsters or rats or rabbits, you get lots of different tumors as a result. These are not the natural hosts for this virus, but you get lots of different tumors, and that's where the name comes from, many tumors, polyoma, when they use uh, the wrong hosts. But in the natural host mice, these viruses do not cause tumors. All right? And finally, the SV40, another polyoma virus. This is a monkey polyoma virus. This was discovered in 1962 as a contaminant of early batches of polio vaccine, which were made in monkey kidney cells. And we didn't know about SV40, so we didn't know to look for it in those cells. And the SV40 was present. It was incorporated into the polio vaccine, both the inactivated and the uh, it, it infectious polio vaccine, and it was given to millions of people along with their polio vaccine. And there's no evidence in my view that these have caused any human tumors, although if you go online, you will find lots of lawyers claiming that they do and hoping to sue the vaccine manufacturers uh, for money, but they don't cause uh, tumors in people. These are monkey viruses. They're pretty restricted. Natural host is the monkey, but they don't cause tumors in monkeys, very much like the murine polyomas don't cause tumors in mice, and they don't transform monkey cells in culture. So we have mouse polyoma viruses and SV40. Let's take a look at the different kinds of cells and what happens. So SV40 is a monkey virus in monkey cells. It kills them. They're permissive. The virus gets in, it replicates, it kills the cells. Mouse polyoma virus, the natural host is mouse. Virus replicates in them, it's permissive, and it kills them. Mouse polyoma virus in monkey cells doesn't replicate. It's non-permissive. Same thing with SV40 in mouse cells, non-permissive. These viruses can get into these cells, but the T antigen of the virus doesn't match up with the machinery of the host, so you don't get early transcription. Now let's look at other species, hamsters and rats, for example. In these animals, both SV40 and mouse polyoma are semi-permissive. What that means is the virus gets in, you get early transcription of early mRNAs, but you don't get DNA replication. That's what we mean by semi-permissive. And it's in these animals, under these conditions, that we see tumor formation. All right, semi-permissive is the key. Permissive, the virus kills the cells, and apparently being totally non-permissive isn't enough to get a tumor either. So that tells you that some aspect of the genome is important. When you transform cultured cells with polyoma viruses, the, the transformants are rare. It's about one transformed cell per 100,000 infected cells. Why, and why is it so rare? And what does this have to do with tumor formation in animals? So that's something that we're gonna explore now. Before we do that, one more player in this DNA tumor virus story, and that is adenovirus. Adenoviruses, family of double-stranded DNA viruses we have talked about here. There are lots of human serotypes of adenoviruses, but they do not cause tumors in people. We are the natural hosts of adenoviruses, and in us, uh, replication is lytic, no transformation. However, uh, some serotypes, including 12 to 18 and 7 to 11, are, cause tumors in hamsters, the wrong species for the virus. So very much like transformation by polyoma and papillomaviruses, which we haven't talked about, but that's the same. It's a rare event in cultured cells, and it happens in the wrong host. And that's the key here. The wrong host for the virus, you see rare tumors. So what is going on? Well, people started trying to figure out at a molecular level what was going on. And what they found is if you look in transformed cells and in tumors, you always find that one viral protein present. Again, this is in the tumors, not the actively replicating cells, uh, the cells with active replicating viruses. They found a viral protein, and they called this T antigen for tumor antigen because it was present in tumors. This is, this is a long time before these T antigens were found to have a role in transcription and DNA replication. And I don't know if you remember, we talked about T antigen in those roles, and that's why it's called T antigen, because they were found to be present in the tumors and transformed cells with um, SV40, polyoma, and adenoviruses. All of them had 
one protein. They're all different proteins, but they called them all T antigens because they were present in tumors. So in SV40, we're, we're talking about large T. There's also another one called small T, which we haven't talked about. And here is large T to remind you that this is a multifunctional protein that's a transcriptional activator and a, a binding of the origin of DNA. And now it's present in tumors as well. Polyomaviruses also have large, middle, and small T. Papillomaviruses, the ones causing uh, the rabbit tumors, and also human papillomaviruses, now HPVs, they cause tumors in people. They also have T antigens encoded by genes called E5, E6, and E7. And in adenoviruses, the T antigens are encoded by the E1A and the E1B genes. So they're all originally called tumor viruses. SV40 was first, so it's proteins, the name sticks, T antigen. But then the others were given different names, but they all have one thing in common. They're all present in transformed cells and in tumors. They're all different proteins. SV40, polyoma, papilloma, adeno, they are all different proteins. The one thing we know is that they're present in these cells. Now these are essential viral genes. You may remember the SV40 T antigen. You need it for transcription as soon as the virus DNA gets into cells. It's also needed for DNA replication. It binds the origin and it recruits the cellular polymerase. If you take out T antigen, SV40 will not replicate. Um, and same with the other viral genes as well in the polyomas, the papillomas, and the adenovirus. And in fact, here's a very important point. Uh, the genes encoding T antigens are often the only viral genes found in tumor cells or transformed cells. So if you take one of these viruses, you infect the wrong host, you get transformed cells in culture, they will often be the only genes present, the T antigen encoding genes. And if you take those T antigen genes by themselves and put them in a cell, they will transform the cell. So a very common way to make a cell line these days is to take whatever cell you want to immortalize you could take some cells from your cheek, put them in culture. You add SV40 T antigen gene, and they will live forever. Okay, so that's what we use in the lab to make transformed cells. So, well, how do we put all of this together? And people were working on this throughout the 70s and 80s, and three separate observations were made. They looked like they had nothing to do with each other, but it turns out that they are all part of the story. Here they are. Number one, it was found that T antigen of SV40 bound or interacted with a cell protein of 53 kilodaltons in size. And if those of you who have studied biology know immediately this is the famous P53 protein, a master regulator which is mutated in almost every cancer that we know about. Secondly, for adenovirus, it was found that transcription of a set of early genes called E2 depends on a cell protein called E2F, and this is a set of transcription factors. We call this the E2F family. We've actually mentioned this previously. So adenovirus early transcription requires a set of cellular transcription proteins, and I, we did talk about how these are normally sequestered in the cell, and adenovirus infects them infection frees them up, and we're gonna get back to that again. And finally, E2F, this, this transcription protein of the cell that's needed for adenovirus, is found to bind a cellular protein called the retinoblastoma protein, or RB. All right, three, three separate discoveries. P53, RB, E2F, with three different viruses. It turns out they're all part of control of the normal cell cycle, as you'll see in a moment. All right, so three disparate uh, observations all come together in the end. So let's see how that happens. So we go back to our cell cycle. Remember, a 24-hour roughly cell cycle where cells divide in a controlled fashion. There is a segment of mitosis, M here on this slide, and the process of mitosis is shown at the top, going from one cell through all the intermediates to two cells. It's actually the part of dividing, and everything else is, is reserved for resting or synthesis. So we have a G1 phase, we have a DNA replication phase, or the S phase, uh, preparation, and then division again. That is the cell cycle. So when you stimulate cells to divide, they go from here to G1, 
then they replicate their DNA and prepare for cell division. Now remember the oncogenes that were picked up by retroviruses act at the end point. They, they push cells uh, through the cell cycle because they're involved in growth control. So you have initially a decision whether you're going to go through the cell cycle depends on whether there are enough nutrients in the cell's environment, like growth factors. Cells have receptors for growth factors. If growth factors are present, they will send a signal down into the nucleus to tell the cell to start going through the cell cycle. Once they get through G1, then they're committed, they make DNA, and then they divide. So that signal, that go signal, comes from growth factors through that whole mitogenic pathway identified by studying transducing, uh, transducing oncogenes of retroviruses that we pointed out before. All right, this is detectors and signaling proteins for growth discovered as oncogenes. All right, so this is an important signal at the top here. We, we're, I have proto-oncogenes written here, but if you have a cell-centric view, you would say mitogenic signals. Growth factors cause uh, the mitogenic pathway, which is basically the cell division pathway to initiate. Now, there is another regulator of progression through the cell cycle that comes into our story here. And that's shown on this slide as a restriction point. So we can have growth factors present, but there are other conditions that have to be met in order for the cell to go through the cycle. And if they are not right, if conditions aren't right, the restriction point kicks in and puts the brakes on the cell cycle. So there's no DNA synthesis and no cell division. All right. So not only do you need a growth factor signaling to get cell division going. You also need a second signal, and that is shown here at the restriction point, and that is what RB does, this protein that was shown to interact with one of the viral T antigens. RB stands for retinoblastoma protein. It was originally identified in kids who have tumors of retinoblasts. These are cells that are precursors to the retina. They're gone by age five, but in those five years, you can get tumors of those cells forming in the eyes. They did analysis of these tumors, and they found that these tumors lack both copies of the RB gene. It was originally found to be a homozygous deletion. They called it the RB retinoblastoma gene. And now we know that RB is the protein that runs this checkpoint, this restriction point. It is the gatekeeper that says whether you can go through the cell cycle or not. And we call this a recessive oncogene because you need two copies of the protein in order to suppress division through the cell cycle. And when you take both of them away, then you get uncontrolled replication. And the other oncogenes up at the top, the mitogenic signal pathway oncogenes, they're dominant because you can introduce those into the cell and get transformation. So RB, you have to take away to get transformation the on the retrovirus oncogenes you have to put in to get transformation. So let's see how this works. Now on the left is a diagram of the mitogenic pathway I showed you earlier, identified uh, using the transducing retroviruses. And this is just a better picture. We have on the cell surface a growth factor receptor and some growth factor binding. And these are a series of signaling events occurring from the plasma membrane into the nucleus. And you can see these proteins have three letter names because they're, they were originally called by according to which retrovirus they were identified in, like uh, SHC and, and RAS and AKT and so forth. Now, when you have a growth factor binding to its receptor, you initiate a signaling pathway. One of the downstream events, there are many things that happen, but the one that I want to look at here is that RB is phosphorylated, all right? RB, that retinoblastoma protein is phosphorylated, and that pushes the cells past the checkpoint, the restriction point that I just showed you. Now, how does that work? You have to go to the right part of this slide to see how that works. Normally, in a resting cell, RB forms a complex with the E2F family of transcription proteins, and that inactivates E2F. Now, E2F is required. E2F is a transcription protein. It's needed to activate genes that are involved in cell division and DNA synthesis. And that's shown here. For example, if you could free up E2F, you would get DNA synthesis and mitosis. That's because all the proteins you need for that are turned on by E2F. 
Now, normally, RB is bound to E2F, so it's inactive and the cell is not dividing. When the mitogenic signal comes down through from the cell membrane, RB gets phosphorylated, and then it pops off of E2F. We now have free, free E2F, this purple protein here, which can then bind promoters and lead to DNA synthesis and mitosis. So that's the nature of the checkpoint. If RB protein is bound to E2F, you stop the cell cycle at that checkpoint. If RB is phosphorylated, it's off of E2F, you can have progression through the cell cycle. Now, E2F is needed for transcription of adenovirus promoters, early promoters. And, and a while ago in this course, we talked about how the E1A protein of adenovirus binds RB and frees up E2F so it could get its early genes transcribed. Same mechanism. We actually brought this up previously. Same mechanism, phosphorylate. Uh, you either phosphorylate RB to get it off or you bind it up uh, by a viral T antigen. All right, so that's the mechanism of this checkpoint. Let me go back to show you again. You can have growth factors binding. You send the cell through here, but unless RB is phosphorylated, you will stop the cell at that checkpoint. So that is how RB works. Now, what's the connection with all the virus stuff? Well, you may remember a long time ago, we said most cells are resting, and if it's a DNA virus that needs to replicate in this cell, it's got to kick the cell into division so that the proteins are, are available to replicate the viral genome. DNA polymerases, accessory factors, etc. Viruses do not like to replicate in a resting cell. So T antigens, what they do is they kick resting cells into S phase. Most of your cells are resting, and most of your cells RB is bound to E2F, and only when you need to divide does RB get phosphorylated. But viruses don't want anything to do with that. They want RB out of the picture to push the cells into division, get past that checkpoint so they can replicate their genomes. So how does that happen? Here's that pathway, RB pathway again. Here's RB bound up to E2F. The T antigens, large T, E1A of adenovirus, E7 of the papillomaviruses, what they do is they bind RB and pull it away from E2F. And so E2F is now free to kick the cell into DNA synthesis and mitosis. So you can get RB off of E2F either by phosphorylating RB, which is the natural pathway in the cell, or you can make a tumor protein, again, large T, E1A, E7, bind RB, get it away from E2, and then the cells start dividing. So that's why these viruses initially make T antigens, is to get the cells dividing so they can replicate their genome. And there it is on the top, again, the big red arrow shows the T antigens binding RB, getting it away from E2F. And just remember, E2F is a family of transcription factors that are needed for DNA synthesis and mitosis of the cell. That's all you need to know. There's one more checkpoint in the cell. One more, one more decision before the cell goes into S. So we have the mitogenic decision at the top, we have the RB mediated checkpoint. There's one more, and that's mediated by P53, that other protein which was discovered by virtue of it binding to SV40T antigen. P53, purple protein here, amazingly important protein. As I said, most human tumors have mutations in P53. P53 senses either DNA damage or unscheduled DNA replication. DNA damage being double-stranded DNA breaks, as shown here. Or if, you know, if a cell's resting and suddenly it's kicked into uh, DNA synthesis, P53 doesn't like that. It will sense it, and it will shut it down. P53 senses these two events, um, and it... It, it will then bind to, it will multimerize and bind to a variety of promoters on the cell genome that lead to cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. So P53 senses DNA damage or unscheduled DNA synthesis. It multimerizes, it goes to promoters and turns on genes that will kill the cell. It does not want the cell to be dividing if it has damaged DNA or if it has uh, unscheduled DNA synthesis. So you can imagine that this is not good for a virus, right? It's, uh, it's got in this cell, it's kicking the cell into DNA synthesis and mitosis, and P53 is saying, nope, you're not going there. 
So obviously the viruses have to get around that, and big DNA viruses can counter P53 in order to block its effects. All right, so how do, how do viruses counter that? Here is P53 in purple. Again, these viruses will cause activation of P53 because they're causing unscheduled DNA synthesis. And this uh, P53 is bound by all of these uh, T antigens. Here is E1B binding P53, and all you have to know is that it targets it to the proteasome. It, it gets, uh, E1B causes ubiquitination of P53, and P53 goes in the proteasome. It's degraded. Same thing for E6 of papillomaviruses. Uh, they bind P53 and cause its degradation. E1B of adenovirus uh, and large T of SV40 simply bind P53 and prevent it from binding promoters that would activate apoptosis and cell cycle arrest. So all of these T antigens, besides all the things they do in the viral genome, they have cell targets, and an important one uh, is P53. And of course, we also saw how they also target RB to free up E2F. So the end result is that these cells are kicked into division so that the viruses can replicate their genome. Now, we're not done with this story yet because we haven't tied all the ends together. But first, let's make sure we've got this part. All right, T antigens are encoded by viral genes that are essential for replication, present in tumors and transformed cells, encoded by viral genes that have been incorporated into the cell genome, antagonists of cell cycle checkpoint proteins, uh, all of the above. Okay, the answer is all of the above. They're all right, and only a few people uh, said um, they are not antagonists, or you said the only thing they are antagonists of cell cycle proteins, but they're also all of these other things as well. They're, they're encoded by essential genes. They're present in tumors and transformed cells. They're viral genes, and as uh, they're incorporated into the cell genome, and they're antagonists of cell cycle checkpoint proteins. All right, so let's solve this problem. Let's put everything together. Two more <laughs> things that we haven't sorted out. First, why is everything, uh, all viral genes except T antigen, why are they either deleted or turned off in cells transformed by these viruses? We're talking about SV40, polyoma, and adenovirus. The only genes that are on or even present are the T antigen genes. And finally, why is transformation so rare? Well, the answer is straightforward. First of all, the late genes have to be turned off. Now, the late genes encode the structural proteins, and if you, if you produce those, the cell's going to die. So remember, early on, we said one of the requirements for transformation was to turn off the lytic potential of the virus, and we do so by avoiding the late genes. So there can be a spontaneous deletion of late genes, so the viral genome comes in, it's, it's just deleted spontaneously, just like you get deletions in any other genes, or you can have infection of semi-permissive cells where you don't get late gene expression. Remember, the semi-permissivity, the replication goes up to DNA synthesis, but not beyond that. So you don't have late gene expression, and you don't have lytic expression of the virus. That's why transformation happens mostly in the wrong host, the semi-permissive host. And you have to have you can't have a non-permissive host because then you wouldn't have T antigen produced and you wouldn't transform the cells to begin with. Finally, the other uh, T antigen must be on and transmitted to every cell. So that means the DNA for the T antigen has to be separated from the rest of the genome and integrated into the host cell. And that's a rare event. All right, so that's why the transformation happens in the wrong cell and it's so rare because the, transfer, the integration of the DNA for the T antigen uh, is a rare event. This transformation, and in fact tumor formation, although as I've tried to explain, they are very distinct processes, these are abnormal processes for the virus. They're not part of the replication cycle. Just as for the retroviruses, transformation and um, Tumor formation are not needed for the replication of SV40 or adenovirus or polyomavirus or papillomavirus. They are accidents uh, derived from the way the viruses replicate. 
Now, I've made a point of telling you from this historical treatment that we learned about this by infection of the wrong hosts. We take a murine virus and we infect a rat or a hamster cell. But it doesn't always have to be the wrong host because we know, for example, that some papillomaviruses highly related to uh, SV40 cause tumors in people, human papillomaviruses, and were obviously the right host for these viruses. So what can obviously happen is that even in the right host, for some reason, some cells escape lytic killing by the virus, and then only the E, uh, the T antigen encoding genes are present. And in fact, in many papillomavirus tumors, the viral DNA is integrated and only the T antigens are produced, which should not normally be the case. So uh, having the wrong host isn't, isn't always a requirement for causing transformation in a tumor. It can happen in, in, many, in other cases as well, like uh, human papillomaviruses. And we haven't talked about those, but the principles are the same, that the T antigens are gonna antagonize RB and P53. So transformation, I say, is an epiphenomenon of a unique reproductive cycle. All right, the DNA tumor viruses need to get the cells to divide so they have T antigens to turn on the cell division cycle and kick the cells into dividing. They inactivate RB and P53. And if that happens continuously without killing the cell, then you transform the cell. Because just imagine, if you have just the T antigen gene present, the cell just keeps dividing and dividing. It's transformed. And if it divides enough, it will acquire the mutations. It needs to become oncogenic, and then it will become a tumor. So they're on the way to cancer cells. I find really remarkable this diagram of the um, cell control cycle, the cell cycle and the two points of control that we've talked about. This was figured out using viruses. So at the top, we figured out that the oncogenes picked up by RNA tumor viruses provide the signals to start the cell cycle. And we call those the dominant oncogenes. And remember, that is transformation by RNA tumor viruses is also accidental. These viruses transform because they pick up oncogenes or they insert next to oncogenes. When you think about it, majority of cases, uh, the transformation is a result of them needing to integrate into the genome in order to be reproduced. And if that happens in the wrong way, you pick up an oncogene or you transactivate an oncogene, you get transformation. Absolutely, with the exception of the fish virus, absolutely not needed for virus replication. So we identified proto-oncogenes in the whole initiation cycle of the mitogenic cell cycle by studying these transforming retroviruses. We call those dominant oncogenes. The checkpoint here in G1 was identified through, through these tumor viruses as well. We identified RB and found that it interacted with and was inactivated by the T antigens of DNA tumor viruses. And we call these recessive oncogenes, remember, because they're present normally, the RB protein is present normally, and that suppresses transformation. And when you take them away, then the cell reproduces uncontrollably because they constitute the checkpoint here in G1. So remember that difference. We have dominant oncogenes and recessive oncogenes. They work in different way. A dominant oncogene, you add it and it transforms the cell. A recessive oncogene, you take it away uh, and it transforms the cell. This whole thing, our whole understanding, it all started with viruses. And in fact, it all started with a chicken, a chicken tumor virus.